at this point. So you know, many of you are headed into healthcare, and a big, I'll tell you from experience, probably 50% of your care of patients is education. It's teaching them stuff. Teaching them stuff about their illness, teaching them stuff about health, teaching them stuff about whatever treatment plan or diagnostic um, procedure you're going to run. So <clears throat> learning to teach is part of what you all will learn in your healthcare trajectories because that's a big piece of it. Um, so, you know, we'll start that process in this class. All right, so more on that later. Okay, so we ended talking about the stomach. We looked at the, the gross anatomy. The gross anatomy is just the anatomy you can see with your eyes um, <clears throat> of the stomach, both inside and out. And we'll continue today. Now we're going to zoom down and look at the specialized mucosa that we have uh, in the stomach. So if you remember that um, the tube that I showed you a couple days ago, Oh, crash, hold on. I'll find it. Way back there. Okay, this. So this is what the, the intestine kind of looks like. So you see that the mucosa is thick, and it has that carpet-like appearance to it. But every aspect of it is actually pretty thin, you know? When we get down to the stomach, we have a, a much different problem. And that is, the environment of the stomach is one of the nastiest places in the body. Okay? The pH is very, very low, very, very acidic. You know, we all know that. The stomach produces acid. Well, it doesn't just make a little acid. It makes a lot of acid. So the pH of the stomach can range from 2, which is like pure hydrochloric acid, up to maybe five or six, depending on how much you put into the stomach, how quickly. In addition to that acidity, acid and living cells don't mix very well, right? Acid is a powerful destroyer of living material. So the stomach has this problem of it's got acid in here, but we've got living cells that make up the stomach wall itself. So we need a way to deal with that. In addition to the acid, there are also digestive enzymes in here. And, you know, the you are what you eat is very, very true. What we eat is made of the very same stuff that we are made of, right? Protein, carbohydrates, and lipids. You know, that's what's in the plants and animals we eat. That's what we're made of. So it means that the digestive tract always has this problem of not digesting itself because it wants to digest the food we eat into its building blocks, but we're made of that same stuff. So what keeps that digestive process from destroying our own digestive tract? And there are a number of features that um, begin in the stomach that make that possible. Okay, so we've got a really nasty environment in here. We've got living cells that make up this wall. Well, one approach is to minimize the exposure of these living cells to this nasty environment in here. One way to do that is to create deep folds, right? So <clears throat> this is the surface of the lining of the stomach way out here. And so this is where your acid is. This is where your digestive enzymes are. But you can see that most of the cells are not actually exposed to that surface. They're way down here in these nooks and crannies where it's much safer, right? Because the nasty is up here, not down here. And lining the surface of this is a thick layer of mucus that further pr uh, protects these living cells from the contents of the stomach that's up in here. So we have this very thick mucosa that has these deep pits in it called gastric pits, which we'll talk more about in a minute. So we have this very thick mucosa. We still have a submucosa down here where we have arteries veins, and lymphatics, and some nerves. And then on the outside, we have those three layers of smooth muscle that we talked about last time. The oblique layer on the inside, the circular layer next up, and then the longitudinal layer on the outside. So we have our multiple layers. Now, because this mucosa is very specialized to the stomach, we spend a little more time on it. We zoom in and look and see what's actually happening there. Okay, so 
Unfortunately, your book doesn't show the mucus layer. It should. Okay, so this top part has a layer of mucus that is pretty thick, um, you know, millimeters thick at least, which compared to cells is pretty good size. <clears throat> and then we have these deep glands or, uh, well, glands, and then they end in pits. So if we zoom in and we look at one of these, <clears throat> first of all, we see these guys. These are mucus epithelial cells. Okay, an epithelial cell, you remember from last semester, lines the surface. Well, this surface is also covered with a mucus, so we call those mucus epithelial cells. They are simple columnar epithelium. So under the microscope, they all look the same. They're um, tall, uh, tall, thin cells, and their nuclei are mostly at the bottom, just like you kind of see here. So the job of these mucus epithelial cells is to um, secrete that mucus and also to stand between the nasty contents of the stomach and the underlying tissues which have no protection to that acid and digestive enzyme. In some ways you could say that one of the jobs of these mucus epithelial cells is to reproduce and die because they are constantly dividing. So the cells divide um, here at the neck region, so down in the, the bottom of this first part of the pit. So they divide and then they move up. So by the time the cell gets up here, it's about done with its lifespan anyway. So it only has to endure this nasty environment for a couple of days before it dies, is shed, and digested by the rest of the digestive tract. So cells are always being uh, made here, and they're sloughing off and dying up here. Now that may seem like a waste of energy, but this environment in the uh, stomach is so nasty that it's one of the few ways to actually do this, is to just have a constant supply of cells that go up into that nasty environment, get killed off by it, are released, but are then replaced by a fresher cell. So that pattern happens all throughout the digestive tract, where the, the body protects itself from the, the nasty environment inside the lumen by constantly replacing cells and having them die off and be replaced. This is one of the reasons why radiation and chemotherapy cause a lot of GI symptoms, is these cells are some of the most rapidly dividing cells in the body. Cancer treatments target rapidly dividing cells. So wherever you have rapidly dividing cells, you're going to have problems when you are treating a patient for cancer. You know, tumors divide rapidly too, so that's the target. But there are all these other cells in the body that also rapidly divide and end up getting killed off too. Okay, so that's these mucus epithelial cells protecting, making mucus, and living and dying, basically, to protect the underlying tissues. As we get down past the neck, though, we get into what are called the gastric pits. Well, this the pit is up here, sorry. This whole thing is a gland, but this is the pit as a neck, and at the end we have these glands. These cells down here are in different colors because they do different things, and they secrete stuff, okay? So these cells make mucus and protect. These guys make a variety of things. Okay, so the sort of salmon-colored ones, the sort of light orange. Can you flip that first light off for me? This, I don't know if our projector bulb is not is wearing out or what, but. Okay, so these sort of orangish shells, those are parietal cells. And your book left out, their most important function is they make acid. They make hydrochloric acid, okay? Same stuff that you all use in a chemistry lab. You know, hydrochloric acid will dissolve just about any metal, you know, even um, some of the precious metals. So tough stuff. That hydrochloric acid is secreted, and it works its way out here into the lumen where it drops the pH of the stomach. Why that happens, we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so that's the parietal cells. You have a bunch of these sort of pinkish cells. Those are called chief cells. They produce pepsinogen. Pepsinogen, remember, anytime you see ogen, that is a precursor protein, right? Pepsinogen becomes pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that digests proteins. In other words, an, an enzyme that turns long chains of amino acids into shorter chains of amino acids. Okay, so pepsinogen from the chief cells. 
and then the G cells in yellow, they produce hormones. In particular, they produce the hormone gastrin, which we're going to talk more about in a minute. So you should know these three cell types, parietal cells, G cells, and chief cells, and what they produce. So parietal cells make hydrochloric acid. Parietal cells also produce intrinsic factor, which is necessary for us to absorb vitamin B12. It's a very little, it's a sort of a niche thing, but we have to have B12 in order to live. So it's important, <clears throat> but it's not as important as the hydrochloric acid these cells produce. Um, G cells, G cells. Now, this pepsinogen, this inactivated form, is another way the digestive tract keeps from digesting itself. If pepsin was released intact in its active form, it would digest the cells that made it, because cells are made of proteins as, long as, as well as other things. So to prevent auto-digestion, digestion of cell, many of these digestive tract um, enzymes that we're going to talk about are released in an inactive form, and then they're activated when they get to where they're going to do their job, which is digesting the food that we've eaten. Okay, so pepsinogen is, doesn't do anything, but by the time it gets out here, the acid in the stomach turns pepsinogen into pepsin, and then pepsin breaks down proteins. <clears throat> the chemistry, the biochemistry part, comes in the next chapter. Okay, so I'm introducing some of these. We're going to talk much more about it in the next chapter. We're going to follow digestion for all the major types of nutrients. Okay, so just so you don't think I'm not telling you the whole story, we're going to get to that. All right, so <clears throat> um, pepsinogen becomes pepsin. All right. So the fact that the parietal cells can produce acid is kind of remarkable, really. Um, because acid, by its very nature, is destructive to living cells, this system for producing acid is sort of unique in the body. And it happens because of some <coughs> uh, cellular machinery that's arranged just for this purpose. Okay, so to orient you, this is um, the, the tissue side, the body side, the interstitial fluid. So we're out here, okay? So that's this area is this side. Um, on this side, this is the lumen side. So this is the side that's pointed at the, the what's inside the stomach. And we've seen this equation before, and you're going to see it a couple of more times. CO2 plus H2O makes carbonic acid, right? Well, that's an acid. That's good. We want an acid. This carbonic acid breaks down into bicarbonate and H+. Plus. That should look familiar, right, from the last unit. And here's where the fancy happens. The H plus is pumped in one direction. The bicarbonate is pumped in another. So we've taken two neutral things, made an acid, broken that acid, sent the base one way, and the hydrogen ion another. So that's sort of the foundation for how we create acid for the stomach. This is also the system that the kidney uses to create acid when it needs to, too, which we'll see in our last unit together. So the H plus goes this way, the bicarbonate goes this way. Now, you can't throw charges around without putting the opposite there, or we get electrostatically charged and we would stick this up, right? So that doesn't make sense. So to balance the plus, we get a chloride that moves, bless you. Why chloride? Because chloride's everywhere in the body, and it's relatively inert. So it's a convenience molecule. It could be any other um, negative ion, but because chloride is always around, the body just pumps chloride in along with the uh, H+. Plus. So together, we get HCl, good old-fashioned hydrochloric acid. Um, and it functions in the very same way as the stuff in the glass bottle does in chemistry class. Okay. So we call this a proton pump, this yellow guy right here, because an H+, plus is a proton. Remember that from chemistry. So we call this a proton pump, because it pumps the proton out. Many of the medications that are used today to treat um, common heartburn, gastroesophageal reflux disease, they fall into the category of PPI, proton pump inhibitor. They inhibit this protein right here. So like Prilosec or Prevacid works by blocking this pump, 
if protons aren't pumped out, that the stomach is less acidic because less acid has been pumped into it. All right. And then the last point from this slide is the bicarb is not irrelevant. So it carries a charge opposite the H+. So when your stomach is making acid, your stomach is pumping bicarbonate into your bloodstream. So what you see if you do careful measurements of a person's pH is when their stomach is producing acid, they actually become a little basic. Their pH goes up a little because of all this bicarbonate that's being created by the stomach and dumped into the bloodstream. We call that the bicarbonate tide, um, where we get bicarb levels go up as the stomach produces acid uh, because of this going in opposite directions thing. Could that be harmful? What? The basic? No, the, bi the body's adapted to it. Um, what we do is we breathe a little faster to get rid of that. Um, we back this equation up the other way like we saw in the last unit. So you do breathe a little faster when your stomach's producing acid, but that's all that happens. All right. <clears throat> so why is acid important? Well, one of the things it does is it turns pepsinogen into pepsin. And then pepsin activates, or pepsinogen is activated by turning into pepsin. And then pepsin starts breaking up proteins. One of the principal roles of the stomach is protein digestion. So much of the protein digestion that occurs in our digestive tract happens here in the stomach. It's why when you eat a meal that's high in protein, it takes longer for the stomach to empty because it has to break down all that protein before it can move on to the next stage. All right. So our parietal cells. All right. So before we get into the small intestine, we'll talk a little bit about its specialization. So the gastric mucosa is specialized for protection, acid production, and pepsin production. The intestine is specialized for surface area. And the reason for that is it is at the boundary between the lumen and the surface. Okay, this is the surface, right, in pink here. That is where most final stages of digestion occur. It's also where absorption occurs. So there's no point in eating if the nutrients can't be absorbed into the bloodstream for the cells to use. So the business end of the digestive tract is this surface right here, where absorption will occur, where uh, uh, amino acids, simple sugars, and fatty acids will be absorbed into the body so that then they can be used for cellular metabolism. So to make that surface area as big as possible without making our abdominal cavity as big as possible, we have folds inside of folds inside of folds. Okay, so we saw this last time. So these broad folds that are permanent, they're there all the time, and that you can see with the naked eye, we call those plica circularities. Okay, classic Latin term that hasn't changed. Um, <clears throat> basically, that just means a pillar fold. Um, so the plica circularis are the first level of folding. Um, then lining those folds that are permanent, we have the villi. Villi are the little tufts of carpet, okay? And they further expand the surface area because we have all of these little tops and bottoms, so we have much more surface this way. Um, and then as we zoom in, which we're gonna do in a minute, and look at the villi themselves, each cell lining the villi has folds at its top, too, similar to what we saw in the respiratory tract, only for a different purpose. So the reason for all of that surface area is for absorption and digestion. Okay, so the bigger the surface area, the more effectively we can bring nutrients in. Um, it's one of the, 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 the reason our digestive tract is as large as it is, is because of the limits of how uh, we can fold things and still have it work. Okay, so, you know, in um, <clears throat> animals with much larger digestive tracts, like the herbivores, um, <clears throat> they have spent more on more digestive tract because there's only so many folds you can do before the cells are so close to each other that they can't function properly. So there's all, there still is a limit. <clears throat> all right, so the mucosa of the intestines this is the mucosal layer, right? And we have these villi that stick up, 
And then in between them, we have these pits. Um, they're either called intestinal pits or more commonly intestinal crypts. You know, like you find a dead mummy in a crypt. Well, it's a deep hole is what that word means. So we have these crypts in between them. And it's down here in the holes, this is where cell division is occurring. So just like we saw in the stomach, where cell division occurs down low, and then the cells work their way up to the top, and then are shed and die, we have that same pattern here in the intestine. So <clears throat> cells are uh, dividing here, and as you, they work their way up. So the oldest cells in this lining are here at the tips, are here at the top. So by the time they get up here to the tips, they're pretty much worn out, they're past their lifespan, they die, they're shed into the intestinal lumen out here, and then our bodies being excellent recyclers, they're digested, and the nutrients they contain are absorbed along with the food that we eat. So we're not losing anything, except the cost of having made those cells in the first place, but we're not losing any of the raw materials. All right. So um, some of what you digest every day is yourself. <laughs> your own cells that have died and been shed. Um, and again, like I said, talk about chemotherapy and radiation. This is why diarrhea is very common in chemotherapy and radiation, is because these cells, because they produce rapidly, are killed off by the chemotherapy that breaks down this lining and you get nutrients that are passing right through the patient. So you see that as uh, diarrhea. Here in the stomach, the stomach gets irritated because its cells are rapidly dividing. Those cells die. Stomach gets irritated. Irritated stomach swap. Yeah. There's also some direct effects too. Chemotherapy is a poison. It's a toxin. You know, in it, the trick with cancer treatment is you kill the tumor without killing the patient, um, because the medicines that are used are poisons. They will kill anybody in, in big enough amounts. And one of the body's response to a poison is vomiting. Get it out. Only it's not going in that way. It's going in the vein, but the body doesn't know that. Well, now that you're showing us all these layers of the stomach, which part of the stomach, which layer gets like the most irritated? This top layer right here. Because as the cells can't divide fast enough because the chemotherapy is killing them off, mm -hmm. there gets to be fewer and fewer and less and less healthy cells up here. Yeah. That causes this to get inflamed, and that triggers vomiting, even uh, uh, also. Yeah. Now, there's things we do to help patients with those things, but um, that that's the core of it. Yeah. But the real, the vomiting associated with chemotherapy, it's that toxin effect more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So, what causes like a stomach ache? The same sort of thing, or? Yes, um, uh, like a viral stomach infection. It affects these cells, these cells die off. That causes the underlying tissue to get irritated, and you experience that as nausea for some people, pain for other people. Yeah. It's not like you've got a big hole where you've got lots of bleeding, like an ulcer. It's more like you've got a million little tiny holes. That, so it's not causing a massive breakdown, but it's making everything irritated and pain. Good question. Good. Okay. So then, so the mucosa is where all the action is, but you still have a submucosa, just like we've seen now in these other parts of tissue. And we have our two layers of smooth muscle, circular layer and um, longitudinal layer. It's doing the motion, right? So it's doing that peristalsis and segmentation that we talked about on day one on this. Okay, so now we zoom into the villus, right? So we're gonna take one of these guys, we're gonna zoom into it. Um, so this is one tuft of the carpet. Right Down through the middle of that tuft, you've got a great big lymphatic that gets a special name called a lacteal. The reason it's called a lacteal is what comes out of it looks like milk. Okay, Lactose is lactus, is the uh, Latin word for milk. And so what comes out of this are absorbed fats, which are creamy looking, they're white. So we call these a lacteal. More on that again in the next chapter. Then we have our artery and vein and a capillary head in between. This is the business end. Remember, everything that's going to come in from the digestive tract is going to pass through this layer of cells, and it's going to have to get to the rest of the body, which means you need a capillary bed to pick it up, right? So the blood that comes in to this capillary bed is relatively nutrient poor. The blood that goes out of this capillary bed is, has all the nutrients that have been absorbed through that lining, 
right? So this is where the, the uh, nutrients are actually entering the body proper into the bloodstream. And you don't see it very well in this picture, but these cells have a furry border. Do you see that in light purple? Um, if I were to zoom into one of those cells, it's a classic Bart Simpson cell. Looks like this, right? So <clears throat> it has this fuzzy border. We call this the brush border. And in the respiratory tract, the, the Bart Simpson hair were cilia. Remember that beat and move that mucus um, and everything trapped in it? These are not cilia. These are microvilli. They don't move. Their purpose is not motion. It's surface area expansion. Okay, so just like we have all these folds, well, the surface of each cell lining those folds has folds, again, at the top. And it's for the same reason. It's because it's through this, it's through this membrane that absorption is going to actually occur. So the more membrane you have, the easier it is for nutrients to pass through this cell. <clears throat> so nutrients go through that cell and then into the blood down here, right? <clears throat> and then out to the rest of the body <clears throat> after a brief stop at the... Um, at the liver. So this is called the intestinal brush border, and you'll hear that term used in your, in your clinical land um, because it's one of the sites where the digestive tract really does a lot of work. So like in a diarrhea illness, the reason you get diarrhea is in part because your brush border has been disrupted. When these cells get sick, they lose their hair and they get kind of flat at, top, at the top, so they can't absorb things as well and nutrients passing through the system unabsorbed pull water in by osmosis, so you get very watery stools that can cause massive dehydration um, in a <coughs> uh, diarrhea illness because it's of, of effects at this brush border. All right, and like I said, more on what happens at this border in the next chapter, because we're going to talk about at this border is where carbohydrate digestion finishes protein digestion finishes, and fatty acid digestion happens. So it's a very busy place. Not only is it a place for absorption, but you have massive biochemistry happening at that thin membrane between the lumen and the body's tissue. Yes? How long would it take for those cells to be replaced again? Days. Um, they, uh, well, I know we talked about that. So wherever they, they're made here and they come here, that's about a five-day journey. So these cells, just like the stomach, are rapidly produced. So you don't have an intestinal brush border cell that's more than a week old, ever. So they're always just being replaced all the time. And then their parts are, are uh, re recycled by being reabsorbed and rebuilt. All right. Okay, so the small intestine is the biggest part of the thing in terms of, you know, what takes up most of your abdominal cavity well, your liver takes up about a quarter of it. The liver is huge. Um, but then the intestine takes up the next, the next biggest part. And there are lots of ways of organizing um, how you think about the abdomen. You know, I think in terms of the anatomy of it, but um, there's also location. So <clears throat> these, this quadrant system here, this tic-tac-toe grid, um, is one way of dividing up the abdomen. This is how we do it in clinical land. You know, so that if, let's say somebody, oh, I have pain right here. So you can document in the chart where that here is. This system, though, don't learn this system because nobody uses this system. Um, people instead use quadrants. So there's right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant. Okay? And then the umbilical region is still used. That's the region around the belly button. So that's the general belly spot. Um, but don't learn these. Nobody talks about the hypochondriac region. Um, anymore anyway. But <clears throat> the parts of the intestine are also in this picture, and that's why it's here. Okay, so the stomach's up here. It's been cut away. The first part of the small intestine, that's the duodenum, right? It's C-shaped, right? And inside the duodenum, its job is not really absorption. 
Its job is to take what comes from the stomach and neutralize it to the point that it can go through the rest of the system. So it has very smooth walls with very short villi and few folds. So of all the places in the small intestine, it has the least surface area. You know, more on why that's true when we get to there in a minute. Okay. Second part of the small intestine, which is shown here in purple, is the jejunum. The jejunum is where most absorption and most digestion occurs. It's the busiest place in the digestive tract. Because of that, it has deep folds, very long villi, massive surface area. You know, the, if you took, if you could somehow unwrinkle the jejunum, it would take up the size of like a gymnasium, okay? Because there's just a ton of surface area in the jejunum. And it's because of its job is to digest and absorb, which you need a surface for that. The ileum is the longest region. It's here in Perpin, uh orange, and its job evolutionarily is to pick up the rest of what the jejunum didn't. So the jejunum, you know, if you, you eat something, 90% of the nutrients that were in that meal, the jejunum is going to absorb, digest and absorb. The remaining 10% gets picked up in this remaining longer portion called the ileum. And in terms of specialization, the ileum is more folded than the duodenum, but le much less folded than the jejunum. Okay, so um, it has short villi, still has plica circularis, but not very many, um, <coughs> but it is the longest. So um, it's, it has more surface area because of its length, too, but its job is to get the rest. And then we get into the large intestine, which we talk about at the end. Okay, so the three regions of the small intestine. Important to know because of their differences. The duodenum evolved to do one thing, the jejunum evolved to do something different, and the ileum a third thing. So they're different. And even in the in the, the living patient with their abdomen open, you can tell the difference. The jejunum is thicker, um, and the ileum is much thinner, and the, the duodenum it has a different appearance too. So they really do these regions look different. But the, we call the whole thing the small intestine. So small intestine has three parts. Okay, so this shows you some... So here's the jejunum. So what we've done is we've taken that tube, okay? We've cut along the top and we've opened it so you can see inside, right? So you're looking at the inside of the tube. And you can see these deep folds, right? You know, there's not a smooth spot there. That's the plica circularis of the jejunum. Very thick. And you can't see it in the picture, but the... Um, the mucosa is also very fuzzy. It's like shag carpet in the jejunum. It's very thick, long cups. The duodenum, though, smooth walls, really, you know, and very little um, carpet on those walls. And then the ileum is sort of somewhere in between these two. So it has some folds, but it doesn't have that thick carpeting or those deep folds that the jejunum has. All right. Good. All right, so great. I don't have my phone. We have to use by hand. Okay, which of these enhance the absorptive effectiveness of the small intestine? The we'll talk. What do you think? Hey, anyway. C does. Yep. Any other answers? Yeah, they all do. So the villi, those are the hills. Villas, it means hill. You know, like in Italy, they have villas. You know, some of you are going to go out and make a ton of money. You'll have an Italian villa someday. Um, <clears throat> well, it's the, the, that villa means hill. So they look like the hills. The plica circularis are the permanent folds that stick out. So they increase surface area. The microvilli, Bart Simpson here. And the movements do too. Uh, segmentation in particular, because segmentation is pushing that thick mucosa into the contents of the lumen all the time. That improves the effectiveness by squishing the food stuff against that um, uh, lining, you increase the absorption. So yeah, that's all of those. This is from last time. The double layer of serous membrane that supports the viscera are called which of those? 
D, good. Those are mesenteries. Mesenteries are the suspension system. And they're made up of, so on the outside of the tube is the serosa, and it comes around and joins together into a two-layered sheath, and that's what holds it then from the back of the abdominal wall. And all the following are true of the lining of the stomach, except which of those? Near E, yeah. We haven't even talked about bile yet, right? Bile comes from the liver. The liver empties below the stomach. So there's no, there should never be bile in the stomach. Now, in gastric illness, sometimes people will complain of green vomit, bright green vomit. That is because things are backing up. Um, because that bright green comes from the liver. And if it's in the stomach, it means that it's gone back up the duodenum and backwards, you've got things moving backwards. And while that isn't like, oh my gosh, you're gonna die concerning, it is concerning because it says there's something major going on with your digestive tract, particularly if it persists. Um, okay. So we have the stomach, we have the small intestine. Now let's push play and put some of these things in motion. You know, so how do these different regions interact? So as promised, you have some hormones to learn in this uh, chapter. And um, these five are all uh, need to know. Okay. Gastrin comes from the G cells that we talked about already. So it comes from the stomach. Gastrin also comes from the duodenum. And gastrin is a gastric stimulator. So it's called gastrin because it's, it affects the stomach. And essentially, gastrin turns the stomach up. So what does the stomach do? <clears throat> it churns, it makes mucus to protect itself, it makes acid, and it makes pepsin. Gastrin increases all of those things. So it increases gastric mobility or motility, it increases acid production, mucus production, and pepsin production. Okay. Secretin comes from the duodenum, <clears throat> And it affects the liver and the pancreas. And from its name, you might guess that maybe it stimulates secretion, right? And it does. It gets the liver to secrete more, and it gets the pancreas to secrete more. Um, more on what is secreted later on. GIP, gastric inhibitory peptide, kind of does what its name says. It inhibits the gastric system. So it inhibits the stomach. And essentially, it works opposite gastric. So GIP turns the stomach down. And the reason it does that, some things we eat take longer to digest than other things do. Fats, in particular, take a long time to digest. So when we have a meal that's high in fat, gastric inhibitory peptide slows the stomach down so that the small intestine has more time to do its thing. So it slows digestion, it slows transit. CCK, of all of these, this is the one that those of you who are going to take care of patients are going to see in patients from time to time. Cholecystokinin. You know I like to take words apart because it helps to make it not arbitrary. Okay. Chole is bile. Okay, that's the, the Greek, I think, maybe Latin, I think it's the Greek though, of uh, a word for bile. Cysto is a cyst is a, um, a an empty ball, right? You know we've all we've heard that term. Well, in the the uh, digestive tract, whenever you hear cysto, they're talking about the gallbladder, okay? Because the gallbladder is a ball, that, so they call it cystis, the coleocystis, bile cyst. So bile that's gallbladder. Kynin, think kinetic. You know, many of you have had at least a little physics in your time. Kinetic is motion, right? It's motion energy. And that's what it means. Kinin motions or activates a thing. So this activates the bile and the gallbladder. So it's a bile activator. Cholecystokinin. Okay? And it does what its name said. I want you to know what the word, what the pieces mean. So it stimulates the bile system. So that's the liver. The liver produces bile. 
That's the gallbladder. The gallbladder stores bile until it's needed. Um, and cholecystokinin also um, stimulates the pancreas to produce uh, secretions too. CCK is our fat digesting hormone. It doesn't digest the fats, but it gets the digestive tract ready to digest fats. You know, so you, you've had a great big scoop of really bad for you ice cream, right? Col your cholecystokinin level is going to go up to prepare the digestive tract to digest all that fat that's coming through. Um, why does it come up clinically? Anybody have their gallbladder out yet? No? See, you're all very young class. No, slightly <laughs> older class. Many of you will. Some, the odds would say at least 10% of you at some point in your life are going to have your gallbladder out. But <laughs> the, uh, when the gallbladder is in trouble, cholecystokinin levels get very, very elevated. So we, we look at that level in patients to look for gallbladder problems. So that's where it comes up clinically. But in the normal, it's secreted in response to fats in the diet. <clears throat> and then the last one, and in some ways the least significant, is this VIP at the bottom. The vasoactive intestinal peptide does what its name says. It stimulates the intestine's blood flow. Because without blood flow, those nutrients have nowhere to go. Okay, so when um, you're uh, in the process of digesting, blood flow goes up to your um, small intestine under the control of this vasoactive intestinal peptide. So those are all five. Those are five hormones you need to know. There'll be a few more before we're done, but those are the big five. All right. This shows you some of the things I was just talking about. Okay, so gastrin, for example, um, <clears throat> comes from the stomach. It also comes from the duodenum. And it uh, gastrin promotes gastric activity. Gastroinhibitory peptide inhibits gastrin. Do you see the key here? Red is uh, stimulates, blue is inhibits. Um, secretin stimulates uh, secretion from the um, pancreas. CCK from uh, secre uh, stimulates secretion from the liver and the gallbladder. And then VIP um, dilates intestinal capillaries. So this is the what they do. All right. Oh boy. Um, okay, let's we can we can start this topic. All right, so the stomach is where food goes when you eat. We all know that, right? Well, it doesn't stop there. The process doesn't stop there. Ultimately, that food has to be moved into the intestine for digestion to finish. So there's three phases of what happens in the stomach. Okay, the first phase we call it the cephalic phase because it's all in your head. Right, cephalus is head, and in the cephalic phase, it all comes from your brain. And that is <clears throat> when we think about food, when we see food, when we smell food, that stimulates our digestive tract to get ready to process that food. Brilliant evolutionary plan, right? Why not have the GI tract be ready by the time we eat our first bite? So that is the cephalic phase. From the brain, through the vagus nerve, we get stimulation of all the things the stomach does. This is why your stomach growls, right? You know, we, we hear our stomach gurgle when we're hungry. It's the cephalic phase. It, the brain knows that it's going to get you to eat not very long, right? So it's already preparing things for when it kind of gets you to do that. And um, so it comes through the central nervous system, and we get stimulation of all the things the stomach does. It makes mucus to protect itself makes uh, pepsinogen to digest proteins when it becomes pepsin, makes hydrochloric acid, um, so it gets ready. It also starts to move and churn. That's what actually makes the sound. It's, it's the stomach moving, getting ready for food to come in. <laughs> well, eventually, you're actually going to eat, so the gastric phase starts. Every time you take a bite, the stomach distends a little. In other words, it relaxes a little. It gets a little bigger. This is how you know our stomach, which is the size of a fist when we're when it's empty, can get much much larger at the end of say Thanksgiving dinner, right? And it's because it, it relaxes and gets larger with each bite. Um, so that is part of the gastric phase. The presence of food in the stomach also stimulates these same things. Do you see how this and this are identical? So the brain can stimulate this but so can food in the stomach can also stimulate the same thing. So once you start to eat and food is in your stomach, 
the stomach stimulates itself to continue that digestive process. The brain is no longer required at that point. Um, and that uh, stimulation is controlled by a number of different factors, which at this point we're going to talk about next time. Okay, so we'll pick up in the middle of the gastric phase next time. Questions about anything before you go? We do have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes? Um, so how do you um, diagonals work in lots of different ways. Um, they actually most work before the cephalic phase. In other words, they make you not hungry in the first place. They work more in the yeah, How are they connected to the heart? Because you don't want to spend a lot of your liver Well, because it's all the same thing. You know, like um, uh, the classic diet, though, which is illegal now, is in bed, yeah. right? Amphetamine stimulates the brain and it stimulates the fight or flight response. When you're in a fight or flight stress response, you don't get hungry. Right. Um, so it affects the heart because the fight or flight response affects the heart. There isn't the perfect diet pill yet. The perfect diet pill would have you not be hungry and not affect anything else. But there isn't anything like that. So that's why I make my millions? Yes, there you go. Make millions, yes. So when when gastric bypasses are done, what, what happens to the stomach? They make the stomach smaller. Um, they, there's different approaches. One is banding. So they'll take a, a rubber band and they'll put it around the stomach so the stomach can't stretch. So you fill up faster. Another approach, the most extreme gastric bypass, is they hook the esophagus up to the duodenum. And then you're almost instant. You, don't, you eat a little and you're Full because there isn't any place for food to be stored, but they don't do that anymore. Isn't that dangerous? Huh? Isn't that really dangerous? Well, it's, it takes out all that the stomach does in terms of digestion. You can live without a stomach because the things the stomach does happen in other places too, just not as well. So, like a person who's had that direct connect, they would have they would pretty much be on a liquid diet. Um, but they don't do that anymore, so forget that. They band it. So they put a band around this to make the stomach smaller. A smaller stomach means you feel full faster because of this stretch receptors we're going to talk about next time. Yeah? And can a lap band surgery be really dangerous if the person really doesn't stop eating as much? Like yes, because essentially if they eat like they did before, the stomach will just stretch around that band. What and now you have... These, now you have this strange bend. You can get vascular problems. You can get um, uh, arterial blockage. You can get all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Isn't there one that they put the band like right at the entrance of the stomach too? Like they band that little the opening to the stomach. Here. Yeah. Well, you couldn't block it entirely. Or no, 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 no. Right. But you can make it smaller. Is that what lap band surgery is? No, I, I don't know for sure, but I think a, a lap band goes around the stomach to make the stomach smaller. What are they made out of? Like, what, how are they so strong? It's probably some plastic. It's a plastic. Yeah. yeah but it's like, it agrees with the body. But they actually like use the top half of it, I think. And then they band like the top half of it so that like your stomach fills. Yeah. And then. They, the, the fundus is the biggest part, so like if I were going to design the surgery, I'd put a band here because that you're blocking off the largest part of it, but I don't know if that's how they actually do it. So I know they just block off part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the idea is to make the stomach smaller. That's called gastric bypass. Gastric banding. Gastric banding. Or okay. thing. What? That's the one that I talked about. Oh, okay. So they don't do that anymore. I mean, they may still do it anymore, but the banding is the most common procedure because it's reversible. You can go there and